Our next speaker is Professor John Baker. Uh, John is Professor of Anthropology here at Moorport College. His research interests focus on the ways in which the biological capabilities that enable human consciousness are given expression within different cultures. He is the former president of the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness and is currently a co-editor of Time and Mind, the Journal of Archaeology, Consciousness, and Culture. He is co-author of Supernatural as Natural, a Biocultural Approach to Religion. His talk today is titled, The Thing About Being an Individual. Let's give a warm welcome and prepare to participate for John. <laughs> I grew up here in Southern California, and I had the great good fortune of being a member of a family that moved into a house about three miles from probably the world's most famous amusement park on the very day that park opened. And so many, many days in my childhood were spent going to that place. Every time family and friends came from out of town, we would have to go there. That was a real drag. <laughs> Every time one of us had a birthday, we were allowed in my family to request to go somewhere. Two out of three times we went there. I was one of those little kids you see at a place like that, that would be running around in between your legs trying to get to the next excitement. My parents were really cool about it. They use this as part of the way to train me to be an adult. And as I got a little bit older, and as I had more and more responsible choices with the friends that I went with, they would allow us to go off on our own for two or three hours. We always had to come back and check in. The one thing that I could never figure out for a long, long time is, whenever I would check in with these old people, they would make me sit down with them for 20 or 30 minutes, talk about what we'd done, Think about what we were going to do for lunch, make our next organizational setup. <laughs> and you know, my friend and I, we were ready to go. But that was not lost time, I realized later on, because that place brought in people from all over the world. That's where I saw my first, at least knowingly saw, my first Chinese people, my first African people, the first people that looked sort of like me but spoke in very different languages. I learned later on, much later on, that the roots of my interest in watching people, in other words, what made me an anthropologist, could very well have derived from those hours I sat next to my parents, impatiently waiting for the get go, but watching these people go by as I marked the time. And that led to a lifelong thinking about what it means to be an individual. And I've been thinking about it a lot ever since, not only thinking about it, but I've been experiencing it. As I began to realize that I'm like lots and lots of other people, I saw myself as one among many. We're all here, we're all kind of hanging out. That's me, by the way, in the middle, the green guy. <laughs> I was very green in those days. <laughs> and then I went into junior high school and into high school, and then I learned one of my very first lessons about being an individual. I learned that the thing about being an individual is it can get sometimes a little lonely. The idea that no one else is like you, that you're a little bit cut off from everybody else, that you might not truly be understood. This was kind of a lot for my little adolescent brain to process. But, of course, you go to bed enough times, you get up enough times, you end up further on down the road, and I ended up in high school. <laughs> and high school was even stranger than junior high school. It was in high school that I learned that sometimes it seems like I'm the only person there but standing still, wondering what's going on, while everybody else around me seems to have a place to go and people to go there with. So it got a little bit weird. I started to think of myself maybe not as just the green dot among the blue, but as like the only green noodle on the plate. <laughs> everybody else seems to belong. Everybody else seems to fit in. It was, of course, me and my mind projecting, but this is what I went through. And that's about the time that I began to realize the thing about being an individual is it can be, well, 
it can be kind of scary. <laughs> I was hoping more for an <laughs> That was my high school. You guys must have had a different experience than I did. That kind of scary, because one of the things I felt in high school was everybody else seemed to be connected. Everybody else seemed to have friends. Everybody else seemed to have something going on. And here I am sitting in the middle of everything wondering, what am I doing? What should I be doing? What could I be doing? Oh. So in addition to going to bed enough times and waking up enough times so that I eventually ended up in college, I began to kind of intellectually try to wrap my brain around the fact that I, that I exist. And that's when I began to realize something else. What I found out is, the thing about being an individual is, it's unavoidable. You can't really do anything about it. Even those of us that we think are totally alike, so similar to one another that you have to wear your name on your collar in order to be able to have other people tell you apart. They're not that similar. My good college friends, Doug and Dennis, took me a few weeks of really looking at them and listening to them to start understanding that one's Doug and that one's Dennis and never again will I mix them up. Right now I have two students in my class, a Heather and a Vanessa. And I'm working on that, trying to figure out exactly which one's which. I had it right the first time. It was just a guess. Don't tell them. I tried last week again. I saw them out on campus together. I guessed wrong. 50-50. The thing about being an individual is it's unavoidable. And it's unavoidable at a very fundamental level. This is an image that some of you might have seen kind of images that are now being generated by something called the Human Connectome Project. This is a brand new word in the English vocabulary, connectome. The word is less than 10 years old, and it refers to the series of connections in our brains that link the different parts of our brains to one another. This is awesome. As I began to investigate this stuff, and I took a few classes in neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and stuff in school, what I learned was, it's not only unavoidable to be an individual, what I learned was the thing that it's, the thing about being an individual is, it's actually very liberating. Now let's look at another picture from the Connectome Project. What you're looking at here, the blue fibers are coming from the base of the brain, and they're extending up into the top parts of the brain, and then the fibers that you see, the kind of pinkish, yellowish ones, bluish ones, they're going back and forth connecting different parts of the brain. Now, when I first started studying the brain, the first books I looked at, the first atlases of neuroanatomy, it almost looked like the Thomas Guide, the road map. All those little roads between the eyes and the visual cortex, between one hemisphere and another, they looked clean like the interstate. And then we get this kind of imagery. And you'll notice the parts are connected that need to be connected, but you notice there's a few fibers that seem to have a little mind of their own. They're going off in their own little direction. Now, we do know enough about why the brain wires like this. We know, of course, it's a product of genes. And as these neurons develop, they follow chemical genetic markers towards their target. Uh, either these targets are a lot more complicated than we know, or some of these fibers get lost along the way. I suspect that as we continue this research and go a little bit further, we're going to learn that it's these Aaron's little fibers that make some of us perhaps a little more musically gifted than others, that make some of us perhaps a little more prone to depression, that make some of us perhaps a little shyer or a little more extroverted, that make us, that make us individuals. So what I learned now is that we're all different. The pasta probably tastes the same, but it sure looks a lot more interesting before you eat it. We're all different. And that's when I began to really start to wrap my brain around what it means to be an individual. Because what I found out when I fully began to accept the fact, the unavoidability, and what that implies, what I learned is, the thing about being an individual is, 
It can be absolutely exhilarating. I see you now. Consider this individual. This is Bruce McCandless, an American astronaut from Long Beach. 1984, Bruce McCandless tested out a new piece of equipment designed to allow an astronaut to maneuver freestyle in space. This picture is taken when he reached 100 meters, 320 feet from the Space Shuttle Challenger. He is still the record holder of that human satellite that has been furthest from any other human being. When he got back to Earth, he was interviewed, of course, and they asked him if he was nervous. Nope, had absolute trust in my equipment. Everything had backup systems. Even if both of the backup systems had failed, my crew knew how to come and get me. Was he scared? No, nope. I was working with the finest possible people I could work with. He said it was a very awesome experience. He did plan to turn around and face away from the space shuttle so he could truly get the panorama of what it's like to like, stare into a world in which not a single human can be seen. But he said he got so wrapped up in the work he was doing that he forgot to do it. But he couldn't do it alone. He had a whole world of support. Here, literally, you can see his support as he returned to the Challenger, and he's got his feet between the little ties, kind of like a snowboard, cruising on the back of the space shuttle at 17,000 miles an hour. How awesome was that be? He's got the support of his crew. He's got the support of NASA. He's got the support of all the engineers that built that. He's got the support of all the people who paid the taxes, that designed that equipment. He's got all the support of all the people who are thinking about him, wishing him well, in whatever form they might have done to do that. You see, this shows us another thing about what it means to be an individual. The thing about being an individual, and this is what I think a lot of us forget, <coughs> is that being an individual requires responsibility. We can be individuals in and of ourselves, and a lot of us do it, but we miss opportunities, like Bruce McCandless has, or we miss opportunities in a much more mundane way if we forget that our individuality is based on other people's individuality at all. One of the things this responsibility means, in my opinion, is that we have to kind of reach out to those who we see are cut off, and that those of us who feel a little bit alone have to kind of take the chance of reaching out. We find out all kinds of things that we do. We find out that people aren't necessarily as standoffish or as arrogant or as shy as they might appear. Oftentimes what we do is, of course, project our own insecurities onto others, and we respond in, in a whole variety of ways. We have responsibility to one another. Now, as an anthropologist, this is pretty much what I've spent my life looking into. The fact that you and I are unavoidably different, and yet we have to get along together, and we do so, one of the ways humans have invented, by living in groups. And what I've learned then is recognizing that we're all individuals is really not the end of the story. It's actually the beginning. You see, you and I are all individuals in a kind of an amusement park. It's not always that amusing. We're all living in the same amusement park, and we call it, well, I call it Mom. And there's an adventure land there, and we're working on a tomorrow land there, and some of us like to live in the past, go back down Main Street every once in a while. I know a lot of people that spend a lot of time in fantasy land. <laughs> And that's all really groovy. But there are a lot of individuals out there that have never been able to understand this world as anything amusing. They have had to sit in the parking lot, so to speak, watching everybody else go in and have all the fun. 
And that's a real shame. Because that means there are a lot of people out there that are not getting to be the individuals that they could be. And I think it's really important for those of us who are privileged in whatever way it might be, privileged enough that we grow up very close to the amusement park, that we spend a lot of time in there, that we get to have adventures and fantasies and whatever else we might be able to do, that we're lucky enough to get an education, to live in a relatively wealthy society, to have the ability to be able to speak our mind, whatever that might be. I think it's important for us to remember that there are other people out there who would like to go on the same rides as we do. Now that world looks pretty big when you look at it up close. But when you get a little further away, things look a lot different. This photograph was taken on January 31st of 2014 by the Mars Curiosity rover. That's the Earth right there. You see, the thing about being an individual alive on this planet, it's a lonely, lonely planet when you consider the big picture. If you think about the true dimensions of the universe that you and I live in, it's easy to get scared. No screaming required. <laughs> but on the other hand, when we truly begin to understand what it means, we're the first generation of people that have ever been able to see a photograph of mom taken from a distance. We're the first group of people that ever saw a full face photograph of mom in the first place. This is a truly amazing time to be. An amazing time to be an individual, an amazing time to be an individual that lives in all of these different groups. Living on this planet is scary. Most of us feel loneliness from time to time. But I'd like to point out the other side of things too. Because it is unavoidable that you are different from me. It is unavoidable. There will never be another you. There will never be another me. This moment will never exist again. This group of people will never be here again. Every moment truly is an individual moment. And if we understand that, we liberate ourselves from having to be a patterned animal, a habitual animal, an animal that just goes and runs like a little kid from one ride to another looking for the next big kick. Now, when I was a little kid, that amusement park didn't sell you an all-day pass. They sold you a little ticket book with A tickets and B tickets and C and D and E tickets. There were never enough E tickets in those books because those were all the really cool rides. But what I've learned over all these years is that the thing about being an individual, it's the ultimate e-ticket ride. And I hope all of you make sure you enjoy the ups and downs, the ins and outs, all of the little loopy loops that this very scary thing that we call life really has to offer. Thank you very much.